The Hawaiian Ahupua'a system of land use permits access to all resources from mountains to sea. The sharing of these resources created a social system in these islands that ensured survival from generation to generation. Within this living system of production and interaction, highly specialized technologies of fish pond and taro cultivation were perfected. In the following three-part series, historian and anthropologist Marion Kelly, whose research into Hawaiian culture has become her life's work, will introduce us to the concepts and the people through which these unique contributions of Hawaiian culture continue to live. We see that the Hawaiians looked to the landscape for inspiration of their poetry. They traced their very genealogies to the elements of the land. They were the Kanaka, they were the people of old. The places that they inhabited became their domain, the Wau Kanaka. The wild places were the Wawakua, the places of the gods. The Waulipo. The Waulipo is the dark forest, the deep forest, the forest where the tallest trees grow. The cloud brings some amount of moisture that condenses on the trees, trickles down the trunks of the trees, drops off the leaves and branches of the trees, and feeds the ground. The apaa, the leeward savanna, the dry windward forest, and grasslands. And below that, the waukanaka, the domain of man. At the kahakai, you have the strand vegetation, things like naupaka, pohuehue, kaunaoa. And outside of that, kohola, the reef flats, kaiheenalu, the places for surfing, the koa, the places that people went to fish, and beyond that, the kaihohonu, the deep sea. Aloha e, ala e, ala e, a, he inoa no laka kumuhula o ka ana. These are just examples of the way the people of old divided their landscape. Kapaiaina Apau, all of the islands, were divided by the people of old into ahupua'a. A typical ahupua'a is a division of land that goes from the uplands out to and including the sea. When you lived in an ahupua'a in times of old, your rights of occupancy did not end at the shoreline, but included the ocean resources of your ahupua'a. We find that this terrace system begins out by the ocean and goes all the way up to the waterfall in the back of the valley. To me, this indicates that this valley was once heavily populated just as all of Hawaii was prior to the arrival of the white men in 1778. And the people that lived and worked in this valley were most likely the makainana, the common people, because they were the farmers, they were the mahi'ai, the people that would care for the land. In these lo'is, the Hawaiians would not continually force their crops upon them and deplete the soil. They practiced a type of crop rotation where they would allow lo'i to lie fallow just as we are today. We have kalo planted in some and some are lying fallow and we're trying to re-enrich these, these lo'i with organic matter just as the Hawaiians did. So the Hawaiians were really, were really akamai about maintaining their, the quality of their resources. The stream is another example. Without water, we die. The Hawaiians recognize that. They recognize that there was a limited amount of resources here on the island. And as a result, they practice a concept called malama aina. 
They cared for the land as if it was their child. Waihei Valley is one of the largest sources of water in the state of Hawaii. And thusly, the Hawaiians did cultivate this land intensely. This was one of the largest taro growing regions in the ancient days. There were lo'i coming all the way to the ocean. This river used to flow constantly. It was always filled. Uh, right now, it's partly taken by the sugarcane company. This little trickle of water is all that's left of this tremendous stream bed that used to be here, bubbling over with a waterfall and water going on, on down to the taro gardens. Uh, when commercial sugar came to the islands, some of the dry areas needed water, and so what they did is they came in and made ditches and the result was that they took the water from all the streams and the remaining water that they let trickle down is this. Well, as soon as you get down there to the Tarot Gardens, they've got no water. And uh, actually, this is illegal. And the people who are the people of the land who used to do their agriculture in taro and sweet potato now get left with no water, so they get driven away from their kulianas, from their land. There were 33 streams flowing in the West Maui mountain uh, range, and we only have two left. It's puzzling and ironic because we do have a revised statutes of Hawaii that state that uh, there shall be a minimum stream flow in every stream that runs through the ocean. And the tragedy of it all is that when you ask a young Hawaiian if he knows anything about Hiivai, he knows nothing about Hiivai. He doesn't know what it looks like. He doesn't know that it's, uh, that it's, it's an OP, a freshwater OP. So, you know, uh, more education about what's in our streams and why it's important to have them is, is uh, essential. The West Maui Molokai Taro Farmers Association, their role is to ensure that all valleys that had minimal stream flow will be restored. The minimal stream flow will be restored. And not only restored, but that there will be an economic base set up in each of these valleys, which is very important for us. The West Maui mountain range, and I'm talking about uh, Waikapu, Waihe'e, Kaakaloa, extensively done in taro, extensively. Uh, even my grandfather used to walk me through some of these places here and, uh, and, and show me the different uh, irrigation ditches, the awaises. You know, the water source always fed like veins into the land. So when you did have a lot of rainfall, the water didn't gush down in a flood control project so that it pollute the uh, ocean. It flowed through the land evenly. Yeah, this is a Kaakaloa stream, and it's our main uh, water source here in this valley. Um, the water from this stream we use for uh, domestic purposes and for our irrigation of our taro patches. But there was a kunahiki that went up on the hill, went up on a hill here and yelled. One yell. Everybody brought their siko, brought their hose, and went up and cleaned both Awais. And if you didn't clean the Awais, you didn't get water. That was it. Every household had a representative that went and helped. And that's why the Awais were so clean and neat. We're trying to redo that again. And I think the unique thing about Kakaloa Valley is that we control what happens, where the water goes, how we're going to bring the water down. That's the important thing. We control it. It's our ahupua'a. We're in North Kona on the island of Hawaii. And the zone that we're in at this moment is the apa'a zone. These are the uplands, the gardens behind Kealtakua Bay. 
And it was here in the Apa'a zone that the Hawaiians raised the staple of their diet, taro. And uh, the other uh, crops like tea, sugar cane, wauki, and sweet potato. Here in Kono, we don't have perennial streams. And this is why it's so important to, uh, to cultivate the retention of moisture wherever you can. And that's what they did here in Kona. Now we can see the Evi here, and that's the pile of rocks that goes Malka Makai. And so here you have uh, the farmers going up and down the land, clearing the land and making these piles, uh, which of course there's a lot of moisture kept in the ground underneath the rocks, and that could be utilized to grow tea, sugar cane, and a variety of other small uh, plants. One of the things about uh, Kona, you get a cloud formation out over the ocean which protects the land from a, a very hot afternoon sun. And all together you have, I would say, the most ideal cultivation area for dry land crops. It, it really couldn't be better. Uh, and add to that the fact that the Hawaiians uh, actually constructed, built, planted a breadfruit forest just makai of here. They had breadfruit trees that were growing 50, 60, 70 feet high and of course reaching up into the upper uh, atmosphere they will attract more moisture. And so um, this is the kind of thing that the Hawaiians observe in the environment and then utilize to the, the best uh, effects for, for generating the crops that they needed. When Menzies came here in 1793, I think it was, he was here in Kona with Vancouver. He was the botanist on board. And this is what he wrote. Every step we advanced through these plantations became more and more interesting as we could not help but admire the manner in which these little fields on both sides of us were laid out to the greatest advantage that far exceed in point of perfection the produce of any civilized country within the tropics. Now that's saying something. Here you have represented from the ocean to the mountains, the whole Ahupua'a concept, the land provides everything that's necessary for people who are living on this piece of land, all the things that are necessary for life, from the plants that they consume, the foods that they consume, to the plants that they need to make their cordage, to catch their fish, for plants that they need to um, make their cloth, to wear their clothes on up to the forest where they have big trees for cutting and building their canoes or trees for lumber for their houses and uh, everything that is necessary can be grown in this Malcolm Mackay stretch of land. This is the Ahupua of Honukua. Was abundant in this whole upper area of Fonukua, uh, Terra Patches or Malakalo. Okay, Aloe is referred to people who plant in the water, uh, they have water for planting, and then uh, and a Mala is usually uh, on dry land or especially in Kona we use the term Mala. Mala is refers to any patch of any type of food. It doesn't have to be taro. It can be a uh, sweet potato, or pumpkin, or bananas, uh, maya. We used to plant ginger, a lot of ginger in this area too. And the ginger was also used for mulching uh, when there was no amau. Uh, amau would be the top ma mulching uh, material for taro. The area we, we're in right now is about 2,000 something feet. That's perfect for taro. If you plant taro below, below a thousand feet, uh, your taro will not mature. Uh, this is called a huli. Eh? So when, when we plant the huli in, in Kona, we don't have to make a dig, uh, deep hole or you just put it in. And uh, eh. <laughs> it's good enough, you know, to go. 
There's at least ten. Or at least more, ten, yeah. More than ten. Maybe more than ten, yeah. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So from one plant, maybe within six months, you can get ten huli. And from this ten huli, you plant that ten huli, you get another ten from each one. So within a year, you should have enough to plant. Come. This is one variety called mana. One stalk, it, is, it shoots up mana mana like your fingers, mana mana. So the tail will come up. Like that, all different hulis on, on one. This variety is uh, oopukai. It's a good taro because it can be made into poi and you can aipa. First know what aipa is. Uh, eat like uh, as it is, don't need to smash them. And a uh, nice color, purple color. And, well, of course, the kings, they, they wanted color, yeah? But the common people, they get big family, plant small kids, so they, they, taste was the most important. Plus plentiful, yeah. So uh, when pounding your poi, your, your tar is all peeled and it's in here. You would just smash it down, keep it low, so it doesn't splatter around. Then you would hold it in two hands and, and use the edge of your poi stone or poi pounder until you get all the lumps out. Then you you add water to your consistency. But if you don't know how to pound, pa kiki, so you're gonna tend to have poo poo. <laughs> and so, Lumps. Lumps, yeah. Poo poo. Poo poo means lumps uh, in, in your poi. And you know, like, it, old people, they grumble if your poi is get lump inside. See? Uh, they used to say, ale ai ai ko poi. Ai ai means smooth. Eh? Then you can part it hard and make all that sounds in a big loud noise, like bubble gum. Yeah? It's, it's a good fun, you know. And the two guys, uh, uh, usually my mother used to sit on one side, I would sit on one side. And when we get close to finishing, and we see who can make the most noise, you know. Because if, if you, you know, you know how cracking gum is, and that thing, pak, pak, really nice sound. And that's, that's wali, that's wali, really. that means it's finished. And then you put them in your container. The, the mud holes are very important in Kona especially because we don't have any rivers or, or running uh, streams. To survive uh, the plants, we usually plant them in the mud holes because it'll stay muddy for seven, eight months. And then there's quite a few mud holes in the Aupu of Honoko, which I guess nature gave it to us to protect our plants and to keep our uh, young seedlings growing, like especially a taro or that. Uh, it's so important to the Hawaiian people. Kalopake for Upelu cham, palu, grated and mixed with pumpkin. This uh, particular taro, beginning from the kuhina of the huli, which is the stalk here, going down to the end for the beginning where it started growing, is approximately five feet in length. This is the luau leaf from the pake taro, real good, tender. Uh, the old Hawaiians never like nowadays, you, they use any type of leaf. The old people only use this type, even on the poitero. And then the upper root, uh, we, we planted a few here and there for... Sometimes people uh, want to chew on it and for medicine. Uh. The guava shoots was used for medicine. This uh, shoots here yeah, about an inch and a half from the, from the tip. Uh, for diarrhea. Yeah, you pluck this off the shoots here, you can pick off these big leaves and fold this whole thing and put them out and show it. Bit about it. <laughs> Good. Yeah, this is the old trail uh, where they would drag the old canoes uh, down to the old men sometimes. On this same trail bamboo, they planted these bamboos. These portions, which was too much thicker than the, the young one, they would cut it below the joint here and cut it below this joint. And they use it as a torch. They would go lama lama in the night, that means to, to go torching. Because they never had flashlight in those days. Eh? So they'd go catch crab and uh, in the ponds, plant fish, eh? 
10 ia in the pond. They used it for a uh, frame for their hollies. It's very valuable for them for, we didn't really carry this big ohias down to the beach heavier. So they take the bamboo, except the corner post, they use ohia. Yeah, the ohia is very valuable for make tiki, for house frame. Uh, so there was no wasting. Everybody uh, shared. It was a real uh, family ohana deal uh, in the area. We're here at Molokai at Puko, at Ahupua, from the ocean to the mountains. The name of our company is called Ka'apahu Farms Inc. DBA Neighborhood Store. We are far the largest in, in, in subsidizing local practitioners with their gathering of their products such as limo kohu, limo ele ele, hulu hulu vaina, uh, inamona, fish, any kind of fish from, from akule to ono, mahi mahi and marlin. I buy avocados, I buy bananas, my cabbage, my onions, my lettuce. So I try to, to buy all those things we need from our local people. And the outcome is Hawaiians helping Hawaiians, building a better uh, direction and a better future for one another. And, and when people come and, and, and they eat, they know they're going to enjoy themselves. And you know, so we're living the life that was lived by our people you know, in a good way. To us, the land is fundamental to the culture. So the land itself is the backbone of the people. I found that the lifestyle that was in this village was entirely different, uh, even from where I came from or uh, other places where I went to. Everything was from the ocean. And by getting their fish from the ocean, they trade with the people on the upper lands. So that's how they get their taro or whatever they needed from up there. That's how we live. And when people come from the mountain, they bring us fruits, we give them fish. We exchange, you know, what oh, they happy. So that's how they lived, you know, back old in the Old days fall. like that, the old and days. Those days we feed the core. That's why uh, uh, one come December we stop. We don't catch. Everything is taboo. Opelo, Aku, Ahi, all those fish is tabu. We, we feed them only, you, but no catch them. Leave it alone, like how it used to. Take only what you need and leave the rest. All we ask, leave us alone with our culture. As you can see, the ocean is not very far away. And here we are at the Anchelin Ponds in the middle of this lava flow. Um, now, in each of these ponds, there's brackish water. And of course, that's ideal for limu or algae to grow. And then all around the edges of the dark green algae, you can see a red color. Well, the red color is not algae. Those are tiny shrimps. And these shrimp are called by the Hawaiians opai ula. These ponds were very important to the Hawaiians and they cultivated them and kept them clean and uh, kept the shrimp and used them then in their fishing techniques, primarily for uh, opelu. Fishermen trails often uh, were used at nighttime Fishermen fish all night long, not just when the sun is up. And so you have these pieces of white coral that show up in the night. When you come to an area like this, you kind of wonder why, why would the Hawaiians want to settle in a place you know, that's basically lava flow? Well, one of the theories that we see is because of the fresh water. And probably that's why they settled here at Coloco. This uh, whole business of the fresh water that seeps down underneath the lava flows and is very useful, not only for bathing and washing, but also for drinking. 
And this is a beautiful little um, oasis right in the middle of the darkest lava flow you can imagine. And so this gives you an idea of how much fresh water actually flows out into the sea along this coastline. When you look at the ruins around the Coloco, there's, there's a lot, there's hundreds of ruins. There must have been hundreds and thousands of Hawaiians living here. One of the stories about these, these particular ahu, that some people believe that they may have been originally placed here in order to make the uh, borderline going Mauka and Makai between the two Ahupua. And we know from David Malo's stories that uh, indeed there were oftentimes Ahu at the border between the Ahupua. Mm. And that's exactly what Ahupua means, the Ahu on which the pig, which is a symbol of for Lono, uh, was placed. This particular spot holds a sacred site, which is the highest structure in the islands. Its tradition is that it was built by Umi, son of Liloa, in about the 16th century, so we can date this, say, from about 1500. One of the interpretations of the heiau is that it's a directional register. If you stand in this heiau. On the solstice day, the sun will rise over that cairn, and it will set with respect to the other one. Therefore, from that cairn to that cairn is the swing of the sun from the north to the south. So, you know, it's a very spiritual place for the accessibility you have to this horizon circle and the, the sky overhead the sun by day and then all of the others at night. Perfect place to do it. And if you want to touch base with the past, this is one place to come. I mean, this is to me a very powerful, powerful place in Hawaii. I could see where the great observers like our ancestors were and they were so in tune with their natural environment. These three mountains and this cradle he's sitting in had to be tremendous importance to them. I mean, could you imagine that if there was a kahuna who understood the heavens here and um, and there were students that had to come to a place to, to get that kind of almost great power, that knowledge of the heavens, this would be a great place to do it. If I were to teach navigation, I would require my students to come here. It's a real special place to, to view the stars. In a lot of ways, it does appear close to the heavens. That mountain, Mount Akira, is really powerful to me because that was be my target. I needed to connect myself to something physical here when I come back. It's, it's a physical place, but at a spiritual level. I just felt, I kind of felt like if I'm next to Mount Akira, when I come back, I'll find it. Take it for what it's worth, in 1980, the, the sun set right on top of it. That was kind of like the, the clue that we had seen the islands. We, you know, we, we sailed from Tahiti, it's 3,000 miles of sailing, and my first time, you know, sailing back to Hawaii, and. Uh, Sunset right on top of the island, right on top of the mountain. I think the important thing for me is the health, the health of the individual, the health of the family, the health of the Hawaiian community, the health of the environment. When one part of the Hawaiian is hurting, then I think that whole part really suffers. When we got involved in the Molokai heart and the Molokai diet study. We knew that if we excited people to the point where they know that, that you eat the Hawaiian foods, the taro, the ulu, the uwala, the mountain greens, fish, you eat all that and you could really prolong your life. You know, Hawaiians have always had a real strong subsistence lifestyle, you know, and they still subsist here in Molokai and other rural areas where the fishing is accessible, where they still have the skills of farming. Women just go out weekends and even more often to gather limo. If they're not fishing, the brothers are hunting. This has got to continue. And we need to keep the lands, we need to keep the shorelines available for this subsistence ongoing activities. 
We need to kind of really look at how we can collectively get back into the taro patches. We need to secure those loes. We need to rebuild them, straighten out the awais again, and get back down and start planting our taro. We need to keep it inexpensive. We need to be able to distribute it amongst our own people here. Hawaiians have first preference to the water. So we got to keep that resource. You need the forest above that so you have the rain coming down, soaking into the ground and coming out as the springs that you see all along the east end. Because these are the springs that kind of percolated into the tower patches that were just malka of the fish pond. So we need, we need to look at the different axes, which is important for the picking of, of the herbs, medicinal herbs necessary. One other thing we need to do is, is establish the, the couple, re-establishing those conservation practices. And for me, when I look at these things, these Hawaiian plants, I really see a lot of beauty in them. And now when I look at them closely, I feel very happy that they're still around because they were here since the beginning of time. The beginning of these islands, these plants found their way here and became so different from any place else in the world. When our children are born, we take care of them, we, we nurture them, and we care for them so that we can ensure their own survival. As they grow, we malama and we care for, we do everything we can to keep them. But we need to know that the way that we care for our children, we need to care for their environment. Because our children will not live on this earth without their environment.